Welcome to this message by Ray Stedman titled, The Pattern Prayer, from raystedman.org. The text for this message is from Luke 11, 2 through 4. Now last Sunday we saw the prayer life of our Lord Jesus through the eyes of an unnamed disciple who was watching him pray. Luke gives us the account in Luke 11, the 11th chapter. And as we look together at Jesus praying, I hope there stole over us, as there did over this unnamed disciple, the dawning conviction that prayer was the secret of this amazing life. That it was both the most natural and the most necessary aspect of his existence. And I hope that each of us echoed, as we are echoing yet today, the urgent, clamant cry of this disciple, Lord, teach us to pray. In answer to that request, Jesus gave them what we call the model prayer. And uh, we have a very brief account of it in Luke 11, verses 2 through 4. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. You'll note this is slightly different than the more familiar form which we recited together from Matthew a few moments ago and which was undoubtedly uttered on a different occasion. Jesus frequently repeated certain of the great truths that he gave during his ministry, but uh, in either form, the Lord's Prayer is large enough and great enough to encompass the whole of our life. It's like a mighty rainbow that spans our years from birth to death and gathers up into one all the varied colors of our lives. And as you look at this brief account this morning, you see that this prayer falls into two rather obvious divisions, highlighted by the use of two pronouns. The first part centers on God, and you have the pronoun thy, thy kingdom come, hallowed be thy name. The second part concerns man, and here the pronoun us occurs. Give us our daily bread, forgive us our sins, lead us not into temptation. And this morning we are simply going to confine ourselves to that, those first three utterances that center around the person and character and being of God. It's no accident, I'm sure, that Jesus invariably puts prayer in this form. He puts the things concerning God first. And I rather think this exposes a very fatal weakness in our own prayers, which so frequently begin with us. There's our trouble, isn't it? We rush right almost immediately into a series of pleading petitions that have to do with our problems and our needs and our irritations. And thus we focus our attention upon what is already troubling us and only serve in increasing our awareness of our lack. And perhaps that's the reason why so frequently we end up uh, more depressed or frustrated than when we began our prayers. But Jesus shows us that this is not the way. We must begin with prayer, in prayer, with God. We must take a slow, calm, reassuring gaze at him, at his greatness and his eagerness to give and his unwearied patience and his untiring love. And then, of course, the first thing that we receive in prayer is a calm spirit. And there's no need for us to plunge panically into a flood of words such as so frequently characterizes our prayers. Now this is why this pattern prayer begins with a word of relationship. Father. And uh, 
May I point out what probably does not need to be pointed out to you? It is father, not daddy-o. There's a reverence about the word father that is totally absent in some of the modern expressions of fatherhood. And I think this is the note that our Lord intends for us to capture as we begin our study in this prayer. It's essential, you see, that we must know to whom we are praying. We're not now, when we come to prayer, talking about God. We're not engaging in a theological dialogue. We're talking with God. We are going to converse with him directly. And so it's very essential that we understand whom it is we are speaking to. And uh, our Lord uh, gathers it all up in this marvelously expressive word and says true prayer must begin with a concept of God as Father. Now that eliminates a number of other concepts immediately. It shows us that prayer, real prayer, is never to be addressed to the chairman of the Committee for Welfare and Relief. And I think sometimes our prayers take on that aspect. We come expecting a handout. We want something to be poured into our lap, something that we think we need tremendously. And we're making appeal in the prop filling out the properly prescribed forms to do so. Nor is prayer addressed to the chief of the Bureau of Investigation. In other words, it's not to be merely a confession of our wrongdoings with the hope that we may cast ourselves upon the mercy of the court. Nor is it an appeal to the Secretary of the Treasury, some sort of genial international banker that we hope we can interest in financing our projects. But prayer is to be to a father with a father's heart and a father's love and a father's strength. And the first and truest note of prayer must be our recognition that we come to this kind of a father and we must hear him and we must come to him as a child in trust and simplicity and with all the frankness of a child. Otherwise, it isn't prayer. Someone has pointed out that this word father answers all the philosophical questions about the nature of God. A father is a person. Therefore, God is not a blind force behind the inscrutable machinery of the universe. A father is able to hear, and God is not simply an impersonal being, aloof above all our troubles and our problems. And above all, a father is predisposed by love and relationship to give a, a careful, attentive ear to his, what his child says. And God is this way. And from a father, a child can surely expect a reply our Lord goes on to teach us more of what a father is like in the parable that follows his prayer. And the point of it, if anything, is surely that God is interested in what we're ha we have to say and eager to pour it out to us. A father, therefore, may be expected to reply to us. But now we're not only to address God as father, just simply using the term, taking the phrase, the word upon our lips, but we're to believe that he's a father. For all that God makes available to mankind must always come to us through faith, must always operate in our lives through belief. And belief in, invariably involves an actual commitment of the will a moving of the deepest part of our, of our nature. And so when we come to prayer, if we begin by addressing God as almighty God or dreadful creator or ground of all being, this betrays a very fatal ignorance or unbelief 
on our part. The greatest authority on prayer says that God is a father. And uh, someone has suggested that we can combine the extremes of theological persuasion evident in our country today with this prayer. May the ground of our being bless you real good. But such a prayer is absurd, of course. When I come home, I do not want my children to come rushing out to meet me and stop in some awe before me and say, Oh, thou great and dreadful pastor of Peninsula Bible Church, welcome home. It would be an insult to my father's heart. I want my children to greet me as a child to his father. Or her father in this case. <laughs> in other words, it's never prayer until we remind ourselves that we're coming to a patient and a tender father. That's the first note in true prayer. Then the second one is one of surrender. Hallowed be thy name. And I'm rather sure that this is the petition that makes hypocrites out of most of us. Well, we can say Father with grateful sincerity. But when we pray, Hallowed be thy name, most of us are quite aware that... Uh, we say this with the guilty knowledge as we pray that there are areas of our life in which his name is not hallowed and which furthermore we don't want it to be hallowed. For when we say hallowed be thy name, we're praying may the whole of my life be the source of delight to you and may it, every bit of it be an honor to the name which I bear, which is your name, hallowed. Be your name. It's the same thing we find in that prayer of David's at the close of one of his great psalms. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. That's praying, hallowed be thy name. And the trouble is, when we say these words, we so frequently know that there are great areas of our life that are not hallowed. There are certain monopolies which we have reserved to ourselves, privileged areas which we do not wish to surrender, where the name of our boss or the name of our girlfriend or some other dear one means more to us than the name of God. But when we pray this, if we pray it in any degree whatsoever of sincerity or openness or honestness, we're praying, Lord, I open to you every closet. I am taking every skeleton out for you to examine. Hallowed be thy name. Now, there can't be any contact with God, any real touching of his power, any genuine experiencing of the glorious fragrance and, and uh, wonder of God at work in human life until we begin to pray. And the second request of prayer is that we pray this way, hallowed be thy name. Now, I'm sure that as I say this, we're not only aware in each of us that there are areas which are not, where God's name is not hallowed, where he cannot write his name there. But furthermore, we're aware, perhaps deep down in our being, that none of us can make our lives like this either. That no matter how we may try, how we may set ourselves to try to arrange every area of life to please him, that there is a fatal weakness, that a flaw that comes in that somehow makes us miss the mark. And even when we try hard, we find ourselves unable to do this. But you'll notice something about this prayer. It's not phrased as simply a confession or an expression of repentance to fa the Father. We're not praying here as so frequently we pray in our prayers, Father, help me to be good or help me to do better. 
Isn't it rather remarkable that throughout this whole pattern prayer, not once do you ever find any expression of a, of a desire for help in the sanctification of life? That which is so much our concern and so much the concern of Scripture, but it never once reflected in this prayer in that way. No, Jesus turns our attention, you see, entirely away from ourselves to the Father. And this prayer, this phrase, hallowed be thy name, is really then a cry of helpless trust in which we are simply standing still and saying, Father, not only do I know that there are areas in my life where thy name is not hallowed, but I know also that only you can hallow them. And I'm quite willing to simply stand still and let you be the Holy One who will actually be first in my life. And when we pray that way, then we discover that all the rest comes by itself, so to speak. Martin Luther uh, once said, you do not need to command a stone which is lying in the sun to be warm. It will be warm all by itself. And when we open up our lives, when we simply expose every area to the gaze of the Lord Jesus, when we say, Father, there's no area of my life that I'm not willing, at least, to let you talk to me about. There's no area that I'm going to hide from you. My sexual life, my business life, my social life, my school life, my recreation times, my vacation periods, there's no area that I'm not willing, at least, to let you talk to me about. That saying, hallowed be thy name. And when we pray that way, we discover that God delights to walk, to walk into the darkened closets of our life, where the odor is sometimes too much even for us to stand, and clean them out, and change them, and clear them up, and make them fit for his dwelling. If we walk in the light, John says, that's not in sinlessness, that means where God sees everything. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with the other. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. And then the third cry of true prayer, again concerned with God, is a cry of hope. Thy kingdom come. Now, this can be a sigh for heaven, if you like. And who of us <clears throat> doesn't get homesick for heaven once in a while? Longing for thou be, to be free from the desultory humdrumness of life and uh, experiencing something of the glory that we read of in the pages of the Word of God. <clears throat> or this can be, as it ought to be properly, a, a cry after heaven come to earth. That is, thy kingdom come in the sense of the whole world to become thy kingdom. The kingdoms of this world to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. This is what we sing about. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does his successive journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more. And there's much in scripture about this. And who of us doesn't weary of the senselessness, the sickening senselessness of war and poverty and misery and human despair and long for that day to come when God shall rule in righteousness over all the earth? But I think this prayer is much more than that. It's more than simply a long, wistful look into the future, whether on earth or off earth. But it's a cry that God's will may be done through and by means of the blood and the sweat and the tears of life right now. That is, thy kingdom come through what I am going through at this very moment. That's what this prayer means. 
For if Scripture teaches us anything at all about the nature of God, it, it reveals to us a truth that man would never know by himself but which becomes self-evident as we look at life through the, uh, through the lenses of the word of God. And that is that God builds his kingdom in secret, so to speak. That is, when it's least evident that he's at work is frequently the time when he's accomplishing the most. When we least expect to see him working in our lives. Looking back, we sometimes see that this was the time when he was doing the most extensive work of all. In other words, behind the scaffolding of tragedy and despair, God frequently is erecting his empire of love and glory. And it's in terms of these very trials and hardships and disappointments and heartbreaks and disasters that come to us. When we think God is silent, we think we are walking abandoned, alone through life, and God has removed his hand, and we no longer sense the friendship of his, of his presence, that sometimes God is accomplishing the very greatest things in our life. A few days ago, I sat down with a young man who was telling me the story of his life, and uh, he told how he had gone through a very fearsome accident which had left a physical mark upon him, but that a, a broken marriage had caused an even deeper scar. And he told how before some of these things took place, having been raised in a, in a church environment, he was, his outlook was one of self-righteous judgment of others, sort of a pious disdain of those others who could not keep themselves free from some from troubles and from disasters and problems. But he said these words. He said, you know, the humiliation of my divorce cut the ground right out from under my self-righteous attitude. And he said, I know that I would never have come to my present understanding of God's purpose or his uh, of the joy if I had not been a divorce statistic. So, you see, it's through these ways that God builds his kingdom. What a glorious mystery this is. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides above the storm. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are filled with mercies and shall break in blessings round thy head. Is there any liturgy or ritual of the church which says this more eloquently to us than the Lord's Supper? Here we gather for the breaking of bread and the drinking of wine, and each of these is a symbol of the pain, the anguish, and sorrow, and the bitter, bitter death that our Lord went through. But as Cowper writes, deep and unfathomable minds of never-ending skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Out of darkness, God calls forth light. Out of despair, hope. From death comes resurrection. Couldn't be any other way. You can't have resurrection without death. You can't have hope without despair. You can't have light without darkness. By means of defeat, the kingdom of God is born in human hearts. And this is what this prayer means. O oh Lord, I am but a little child. I do not understand the mysteries of life. I do not know thy ways in the world of men. But Lord, I pray, through these very circumstances which I now find myself in, through these present troubles, these present struggles, thy kingdom come. You see, the transmuting element is prayer. Simple, childlike, trustful, rising out of the helpless need of a child to touch a father's heart. Let's pray.
Father, forgive us for the many times we misunderstand life. Even though you have been at such great length to show show us the secrets of it and the makeup of it, how many times, Father, have we rebelled in some foolish resentment against thee and thy workings in our lives? How many times have we turned away in disgust or despair or bitterness? And yet how many times, Father, have we not also seen that through those hours of, of resentment and burning, shame, bitterness, thou hast been at work yet in love to teach us the truth and to bring us to an understanding of reality? and to bring us back to thy loving heart. Lord, then we come to thee this morning and pray this great prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. In Jesus' name, amen.